Welcome everyone and thank you. We already feel like there was a whole warm up act with everyone putting in their favorite teams and, and where everyone is, is calling in from. I just have to say the way change happens is when we do it together. We are better together. And so everyone, of course, Diana, Molly, so excited to have you both here. We can't wait to hear your stories, your journey, but also our solutions for change. But for all of you participating, this is how we roll and it is about doing everything together. So please continue to send in your thoughts, your comments, your questions. I will weave them in to the conversation. And I just wanna do a big shout out to the Pro Sports Assembly. Um, your partnership is incredible, your impact enormous and bringing all of the leagues together to advance the solutions, to advance women, to advance equality um, and to move sports in a place of equality is really what it takes. Um, we are thrilled to be the Female Quotient and Pro Sports Assembly working together on a series called Her Point of View. Uh, very exciting, so tune in for a continuation of our series. But today our topic is called Lead Her Forward. And it's about advancing women in pro sports. One of the things we talk a lot about is if you can't see her, you can't be her. And bringing visibility to women in sports, not just on the field, but off the field, in the business of sports. And today we have two incredible women that I can't wait to get to know better. And already we were chatting away and, and spending time together. And that's really what it takes. Um, so thrilled to have you, Diana and Molly, joining us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Very exciting. So if each of you, Diana, let's start with you. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and let's already go off script. Tell me <laughs> like, if you have, as a woman in sports, have did you have that aha moment where you felt alone or invisible or needing to, to climb this ladder with um, challenges? Yeah. Like that moment. Yeah, so I, I serve as the chief revenue officer for the Houston Dynamo Dash and BBVA Stadium of the MLS and NWSL. Um, in terms of feeling invisible, I'm a hard person to feel invisible. I'm pretty loud and people who know me, um, I, I, it's really hard for me to stay back and sort of be quiet. Um, I, I think the moments where I had an aha was you know, being a person that grew up as a tomboy, always in the circles with the boys, sort of being a girl's guy, I, I guess, in terms of category of characteristics of my personality, um, getting into the sports world, realizing that all of a sudden being a girl put me on the outside of that circle and feeling that sense of like belonging. Like we have a lot in common. Why am I not invited? Why am I not a part of sort of the boys group that was hanging out socially? And I would say that was sort of my aha was that this industry is so powerful um, the power of relationships is, is sort of the thing that drives you forward. And if there's a barrier as a girl or as, as a woman that you have a natural barrier from gender to have those relationships, um, then you have to break through. And that was a real realization that I had to start to get creative to start to build those relationships and those connections with my male counterparts um, early on. Perfect, so we're gonna get to how you broke through because we all wanna know how you did that. Molly. Hey, how about you? Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. So Molly wardak Fult, I serve as the Vice President of Partnership Activation for Olympia Entertainment. And Olympia Entertainment encompasses the Detroit Red Wings, the Detroit Tigers, and a number of other um, sort of owned and operated properties surrounding the entertainment side of our business as well. Um, I would say that, you know, my sort of realization that eye opening moment was maybe a little bit later on in life from from what Deanna had had alluded to. It was maybe sort of when I was in college, I was a collegiate athlete and being in and around the athletic department, there were very few women who were part of that circle. And then following my undergrad career, when I went on to get my, my MBA and my MSA, my MBA program, I was one of four women in the entire program. And so it was evident that we were just even starting out, even, you know, going and continuing your education, there just were not a lot of women who were pursuing that opportunity. 
um, which obviously affects later on down the line, right? How many people get into the business? How many people are, are promoted and, and promoted and uh, have opportunities to elevate to the C-suite? So similar to what you had said initially, Shelly, you know, seeing is believing. And, and it, was, it was hard to not see women in those roles that early on. What sport did you play? I was a lacrosse player. I actually would have guessed that. I should have gone <laughs> with that. That is amazing. Okay, so let's go back to what Diana you said with some of the challenges and not feeling welcome in the boys' club. How did you um, rise the ranks? How did you get past that and create your own feeling of belonging? Put yourself in there and, and make it work. Yeah, you know, I think it was, the, again, it goes back to the socialness of this industry. There's a lot of social, there's a lot of connections, there's a lot of um, extracurricular activities. And I think that, that the relationship building, the connections are happening in those moments. And those relationships of those individuals are then helping each other and pushing each other forward. And so, you know, for me at the earlier stages of recognizing this, um, you know, I think it was important for me to put myself out there. And I was going to put myself in the position to be the organizer hey, after work, like, let's all go get drinks. Let's all go to the movies. Let's all go golfing. Oh, you golf? Yeah, I golf. You know, <laughs> it was like, and it was, a, it was a sort of situation. I think the other breakdown is realizing too that um, a one-to-one -one relationship was going to be even more challenging. The group relationships are easy, but when my male counterpart can ask my boss to go to the Colts game, you know, that is two guys hanging out. I asked my boss to a Colts game, that's a date, <laughs> you know, like to mm -hmm. realize sort of the, the situation there that this relationship can go on in this sort of buddy, buddy, friend relationship. My relationship can't go to that level. So I have to get creative and take advantage of my one-on-ones, ask for more one-on-ones, ask for that time, grabbing coffee rather than drinks and, and those sort of social settings on a one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm able to start to build sort of my brand with them and sort to en enact them as a sponsor and a mentor for me. Um, and these are to see my, themselves and, my, and me, even though we don't look the same. That's a very interesting distinction. You ask your, uh, a man asks his boss to go to a cult game. It's a buddy system and, you know, time to spend together. You ask the boss and it, it feels like a date. That is a very interesting uh, twist and very true unfortunately, uh, we need to fix that. Molly, what about you? So I think I'm probably very similar in personality to Deanna. I, I try to, you know, I'll bulldoze my way in. Like I try not to let too many things kind of get in my way and, um, and try to overcome as many obstacles. I've sort of always taken the approach that I, I just want to change the narrative about encouraging women to not look at these things as obstacles or challenges, right? But understanding that we have a voice, our voice matters, our opinion matters, our vantage point matters. And so having the confidence to engage in those discussions, um, you know, participate in the activities like Deanna was talking about. Don't be afraid, maybe you're not the best golfer, but by gosh, go out and golf. Oh. <laughs> you deserve to be there just like somebody else does, just like your male counterparts do. I struggle with that. I don't know if um, my counterpart on the sales side is listening, but I struggle with that, you know, being very candid. Sometimes he'd be like, hey, we're going to go with this client and golf. And I'm like, okay, I golf, but I'm not a great golfer. So, but like having the confidence to go because the reality is it doesn't really matter how good of a golfer you are. It's about the connections that you're making during that time. And that's what matters. So um, I guess I just circle back to, to the, the whole point about adjusting your vantage point, taking a look at it differently. Don't look at it as an obstacle or a challenge. Look at it as an opportunity, really. Well, I also want to say, can't we also suggest, hey, let's not go golfing. Why don't we go bowling? Why don't we go walking why don't we go bike riding like let's also flip the script as you said and you know one of the things as both of you were talking being a bulldozer or you know Deanna said I'm I'm not in the invisible type you can you know see me and hear me loud and clear I'm very present have you been told you're too bossy too aggressive to you know has that affected you have you ever heard that one before oh oh yes oh yeah well yeah. I know. Yeah, I hear the the emotional. You're emotional a lot. <laughs> Do 
everyone was hurt. So for everyone that is tuning in and chat, tell us what you've been told. I'd love to hear. And one of the things when you talked, Molly, about flipping the script and, and rewriting the lexicon so we don't look at the negative, but we go to the opportunity and the positive, because I think our differences are truly our greatest strength, yet we hide them historically mm -hmm. or conform to the norm that was preset. Um, Catalyst has done a remarkable job with a campaign called Catalyst Correct, Bias Correct, which is how we take these stereotypes that are, you know, typically negative and turn them into the positive. So you're not too bossy, you're the boss. Or Sheryl Sandberg says, you're not too bossy, you have executive presence. Or if you're too emotional, Molly, what's the positive? You're not too emotional, you're you're strong, you're passionate. I think you're, you're passionate. passionate, yeah. You're passionate, right? Or Deanna, you're not too aggressive, you're... <laughs> I'm assertive. <laughs> exactly, you know, so how do we, oh, empathetic. And by the way, Kim, you just put in a message about empathy. For the record, empathy is one of the most invisible strengths, undervalued strength, no one ever talks about it. And yet, empathy is one of the most important qualities of leadership today. And during COVID, when you look at the countries that have responded the first, responded the fastest, mm -hmm. responded in terms of taking care of people with, with nurturing and, and empathy are the countries run by women, just saying. So <laughs> we need to extol those virtues. And so I, I, let's go to that. You know, what do you think, you know, um, as an executive in the business of sports, what would you say your greatest strength is? And I, I wanna say for the record too, women, have a hard time boasting and bragging about themselves, forget that, go for it. Deanna, what's your greatest strength? I would say my greatest strength is I'm someone that you can absolutely trust with the most critical necessary goal or mission at stake. So I'm the kind of person you throw me the ball, I will make sure that that ball goes in the hoop and we win the damn game. And it's a sense of reliability and sort of meeting the expectation of the moment. And, and that requires an organization of bringing groups together, my people together to all sort of believe in what we're doing, how, we doing, how we're doing it to accomplish that goal. And I would say that's my greatest strength. And it takes assertiveness and confidence and a sense of presentation, I think, to get people to join you on that mission um, to accomplish those goals. And uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know if it's a natural thing or something I built over time, but I would, I would say it's probably a mix of both sort of how I was raised and how I grew up in addition to what I've learned and, and, gr and grew as an individual throughout my career. You know, it's amazing. I heard this the other day, which is don't hire for the job, hire for the team mm -hmm. um, so that you ensure you have that team value add with, you know, the combination of strengths, which makes us whole. And it's one of the greatest lessons that we learn from sports is the power of team, the power of collaboration, the power of growing and learning and sharing together and being open and listening. Molly, what about you? What's your greatest strength? I probably say communication. Um, and when I say communication, I would, I would classify that in two ways. Not only it's being able to articulate what you want to accomplish and what you're trying to get across, but it's also listening. Um, it's such, I think it's, it's a component of communication that is so many times forgotten. Um, a lot of times people are so vocal about what they want. They can tell you what they want, but they can't listen to what a client is trying to tell you, what a team member is trying to tell you. Um, so I'd say that's probably it for me is, is both sides of that communication coin, both, both speaking, verbal, you know, but also listening. That's amazing. And someone put in, um, Kai, uh, one of the negatives is being told, you know, uh, they're too quiet. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we just say on being too quiet, you're not too quiet. You're just thoughtful, you're selective, you're choiceful. Um, so I just wanted to give you the positive of what is perceived as a negative, which is actually a wonderful strength, being focused and thoughtful. Um, so do you have mentors, sponsors, role models, are there, you know, people in your life that um, are your go-tos? Molly, I see you shaking your head, so we'll go to you first. Yeah, I think it's, maybe it's important to start out by defining the definition, de de defining the definition, 
defining the difference, excuse me, between a mentor and a sponsor, right? Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about this lately. You know, I think when we talk about somebody who's a mentor, while very valuable in somebody's career, um, they're definitely, I call it maybe more on the periphery. Um, so they're advising mentees, they're working with them, um, but it's maybe a bit more surface level where I would say somebody who is a sponsor is really vested in you. They advocate for their protégés. They're, they want to see upward movement and professional development for those that they're working with. So um, yes, I would say I have had both in my career. Um, uh, I'll just speak, I guess, from a sponsor perspective. Um, my, I had a boss, a previous boss, um, who I had an opportunity to work for for eight years, and he was an unbelievable sponsor of mine. He was truly invested in who I was, both personally and professionally. Um, he was invested in my family, which is important, right? He knows my kids. He knows my husband. Um, but he also knows what makes me tick at work. He knows where the areas are that I need to improve upon at work and helping me make those adjustments in my career so that I ultimately have the opportunity to grow, evolve, and progress over my, you know, my time working for him. So I feel really fortunate that I, that I have had him as a sponsor. And he was your sponsor. Did you seek him out or he picked you and pulled you up? It's a good question. Um, you know, our relationship just sort of started to evolve over time. And I would not say that I have was proactive in saying, will you be my sponsor? Um, so it probably was just a natural evolution. Um, so probably a little bit of both, I would guess I would say. And for you, because you, I'm sure, are approached by so many people to mentor them or sponsor them. And there is, of course, a big difference. But um, what does it take for you to say yes to someone? Um, you know, I think for me, it's somebody who's truly, who's truly vested in the advice and the relationship that they're about to enter, right? We have so many things going on in our professional and our personal lives that um, you, I, it's important that when I start to work with somebody that, that they don't just want to, hey, can you help me get a job, right? That's not what it's about. Um, you know, there's a, there's a young woman who I have started to have a monthly dialogue with. Um, hope maybe she's on the call. I don't know. Um, and I think she's amazing. She works at Cincinnati FC and she is man, she remembers stuff we talked about from the previous call. She knows about what's going on in my business. And like that shows me that she is so invested in the relationship, which makes me want to be more invested in the relationship, right? So um, I think that sort of operating at a deeper level goes both ways. It's not just from the sponsor, but it's also from the sponsee, I guess, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. <laughs> the asker. Ask her. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Call it what it is. Deanna, what about you? Yeah, I, you know, I definitely have had mentors and sponsors, and I would even include supporters, you know, along my career. Um, I would say my leaders, the, the direct individuals that I reported up to were more than just a leader or coach. They were sponsors and mentors of, of me and continue to be. And so the relationship, as, as Molly even um, explained, it's, it's an evolution. It, it evolves over time. And it's beyond sort of like, okay, here's your job. And this is what my expectations are for you. Run and go do this. It became more one-on-one -on -one and developing. And that started early on. And I think the leaders that I had at the very beginning of my career sort of set that foundation that that was the expectation from all the leaders I should do. And so when I was seeking new opportunities or new opportunities were coming to me, the leader and who I was working for, they had to sort of come with that title of mentor and sponsor at the same time. I thought that was extremely important and that, that relationship would um, extend beyond the time that we would work together. And I thought that was really important. Um, in addition to that, people I've worked with have gone into other areas, have become, you know, sponsors of mine as well, as well as supporters. And it really has taken a village <laughs> to help develop the person I am. And I think that's both on the personal side as well as a professional side. You know, I, my, my mom, my sister, my aunts um, have all been extremely, um, you know, supportive of me. And, and knowing that I have that support allows me to continue to pursue forward 
um, and allows me to then listen and be more open to the feedback I would get from my mentors and my sponsors. Um, from a mentor, like mentoring other people piece, um, absolutely. I find myself in positions all the time where I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations um, I have, during COVID specifically, I've been extremely open to these conversations and I've had over like 80 one-on-ones with people that I have, I've started tracking them that, I, that don't even work for me because I want to be accessible and I want to be open and where that evolves from there, I, I put that onus on them and what you need from me and let's start to define that together. But I want to make sure that, that you're invested. How bad do you want and seek the next level and how much do you value maybe my voice to it? And I will allow you to make that determination or rather not how much you would like my involvement and my assistance throughout that process. Well, you use the word value and I do think it's a value exchange. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a vacuous ask. It is a value exchange. Um, a question coming in about ageism. So we talk a lot about bias barriers, the gender barriers, the race barriers. One of the ones that we never talk about is age, ageism. Um, and so the question is, um, do you think that ageism is a bigger problem for women in sports than men? I'll answer that. You know, I think when people ask me about my biggest challenges, I think age or my perception of how old people think I am is probably one of the bigger barriers than being a woman. Um, so I would say it's a combo. I feel like I have a, like a triple thing, you know, being a black woman that's, you know, young, always young in my role. So, um, and so that had always been a challenge of, of this sense of trust and experience that gets questioned in with that. And, and Wait, you know, I have to say something, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you just said something. So, um, the reverse ageism bias of being too young versus being too old. So I just, you, you have a triple threat and I actually think you have a quadruple. One, you're a woman. Two, you're a woman of color. Three, you are quote unquote too young. And four, you have kids. Okay, yeah. okay. sorry, keep going. I just wanted for everyone to in. I had to give you the reverse ageism and the fourth bias against you. Well, the kid, the interesting thing is the kids solidify that I have experience as being an adult. So actually my kids have become the card. Oh, you have kids? Oh, then you must be more experienced as a human than you're not. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I feel like, yeah, young in my role has been, has been a little bit of a challenge and sense of trust and experience comes into that. So I really have to display sort of my experience and the breadth of my experience, regardless of how long I've been in this role. But Technically, I mean, the, the sports industry is a young industry. Yeah, it's an extremely young industry. Um, and ageism on the other side, no, clearly I've not experienced that. But because this is a young industry, um, I can see that being a challenge for individuals. Um, and it, it all depends on stage of life and position, you know, and where they're ready for in terms of maybe their past experiences too. Um, it can be a it can be a, a, a massive um, barrier and challenge. Molly, did you want to jump in on that one? No, I was just going to add, I think the last point that Deanna made is a good one, right? Like I just wish with so many of these, uh, these biases that we could look beyond the number, we could look beyond the skin color, we could look beyond the gender and just who is right for the job, right? Like it, it doesn't matter if you're 27 or you're 47, right? Like and, and that's so much easier said than done. I've realized that. Um, which is why all of these conversations are, are so important to bring light to it. But um, it's about understanding who's the right person for the job, but it's also understanding about being intentional, right? So Deanna talks about, you know, I, I feel a little bit of the same way, like, even though we are younger, <laughs> um, you know, like, we've shown that we can do the job. And so we need to in, in reverse, give opportunities to people who may be, whether they be on the younger end of the age spectrum or the older end of the age spectrum, those opportunities um, to shine when the moment's right, um, because we may find hidden gems no matter what their age is. So I guess I just add that to it. Well, I think, oh, go Deanna. No, I was just gonna add too, is that's one of the reasons why I'm so attracted and love the revenue world and what we do, what Molly and I do from a sales perspective is that in sales, it doesn't matter what you look like, where your age is, where you come from. If your numbers are there, 
you can't deny me the opportunity. You can't because the numbers speak louder than anything that would be considered noise to you. Mm-hmm. And I can't imagine being in other areas of the business where somebody is able to tell me what I'm ready for or that I'm experienced for based on, you know, just sort of their perspective of it. Um, you can't deny if I'm number one on the board or if I'm top something in the league in certain metrics. And we have an opportunity to control that narrative and to be able to take advantage of those narratives and put ourselves in the positions of growth because the numbers speak way louder than what they're processing of whether or not we fit um, in any of those positions. Well, it's true. Sales is visible results, you know, exactly. bottom line. And, you know, I want to go to the invisible results and how we measure that and take responsibility for that. I do want to give a comment from Lisa um, responding to Vicky's comment on ageism. I had 100% affirm ageism is and has affected women more than men. When I hit a seminal birthday, I was approached with, isn't this job too much for you? And had departments I ran for 11 years removed so I could, quote unquote, relax. So that's why I was laughing when you talked about the reverse ageism. Uh, Just to level set here, uh, this is the first time in history we have five generations in the workplace. Gen Z coming in, traditionalists moving out, but retiring later. We need what I call mentorship in the moment where it's not just about wisdom from top down or bottom up. It's about wisdom that we share all around. There is so much learning that we all can gain from one another. If, as Molly said, we open our minds, we open our hearts and we open our ears and listen and learn. That's where stretch and growth comes from. So let's get right to the heart of the matter since this is really about, um, you know, putting us, pushing us forward. Why? Because we all are amazing. What's the biggest challenge today with women in sports? What do you see the biggest challenge being? It's a big question. (laughs) I know. That's why I'm pausing to see who wants to go with this one first, because I think for us to start impacting change, we also have to uncover the the low-hanging fruit like the buckets what do you think our greatest challenge today is the the challenges are so many of them and we're tackling them and so many different angles and everybody is sort of addressing them and the hard part is the challenges aren't defined by us they're defined by the person on the other end i don't see them as challenges i would think that molly doesn't see them as challenges either somebody else is creating something that would define them as challenges. So as I proceed, I mean, if I was truly had significant challenges and I saw those barriers as challenges, I wouldn't be sitting in the seat, sitting, talking to you from this position right now. Um, and so it's a sense of, of how we are prospectively looking at the environment, the landscape and navigating forward and removing those mentally from your head. The concept, like going back to the concept of this being a male dominated industry, right? Just saying it's a male-dominated industry puts a wall up. Women think, well, I will have no chance. I will have no way of, of proceeding and moving up and, and creating you know, an opportunity for myself because it's all men. Well, strip away the word male, right? And you just look at the industry. It is a dominating industry. If you remove male and you just focus on the fact that the people who dominate in this industry are the ones who succeed, that's what you should be focused on is dominating your area and on your area of the business um, and the ways in which that you can succeed and the way in which that you know that you bring to that organization. It's about connecting yourselves with those people who see you in your best place and give you the opportunity to shine and to, and to impact the organization at the level in which that you're prepared to do. Um, I wanna jump in and say, this is one of the goals of Pro Sports Assembly as well as bringing more visibility to the women dominating the industry, as you said, because we mentioned before, if you can see her, you can be her, and the importance of role models, these stories just aren't shared. I mean, look at both of you badass, dominate, dominating you know, humans in our industry. You happen to be women, woohoo, sharing your stories so that others know they can be what they can see. So thank you for that. Keep going that, Deanna. I know you got something else to add. No, that, that, was, that was it. Perfect. Molly, challenges. What do you think some of our greatest challenges are? You know, I, I take this, I really do take the same vantage point as Deanna about, about, again, changing that narrative and not looking at them as challenges. But the reality is, is, you know, if you get down to the bare bones, 
one of the biggest challenges is the fact that there are not as many women Frankly, it's not just women, it's underrepresented groups in leadership positions across our industry. And that's just a fact, right? You know, um, so again, you know, Shelly, to your point, bringing awareness to the to this issue, um, talking about it, um, advocating for underrepresented groups, and making sure that we're, we're being intentional. We are, you know, I think maybe we'll get to this a little bit later, but like, really being cognizant about how we change that moving forward, because it's one thing to sit here and just talk about it, but how do we take actionable steps in order to make impact and change moving forward? Okay, so let's go there now. Let's, let's go to the actionable steps, but I do want to ask a very important question that um, Raquel, Rocky, I'm going to try this, Rocky. Rocky Eguisquicha? <laughs> I don't know, but it is Rocky. Um, so thank you for at Oh, she says very close. <laughs> Put it phonetically so I can get it right. I want to get it right for you. But your question mm -hmm. is a very important one, uh, Rocky, which says, do you see equity and pay for women in sports as a challenge? So let, before we move on to the solutions, I'd love to put that one out. Oh, egg askiza. Egg askiza. Okay, I hope I got that right, Rocky. But your That's question, good, one. <laughs> what do you say about pay equity? I would say I would say pay equity is a challenge, and the, the biggest challenge is that is that there isn't transparency across the board on what people are making, right? And so that's one thing about our industry is everything is hush-hush, everything is sort of negotiated at a one-to-one -one level. I think there's a range that people are paid, but why they're paid, what they're paid or what they're paid, ultimately you, you don't know. We're, you know, often in our situations, and I would say just prospectively for my own, I'm making assumptions of what I think my counterparts are making. Now I will say I, I've had a moment where it was uncovered to me because I was put in a position where I had to take a lead of the people who I was counterparts with. And um, I was extremely upset, you know, and I navigated the best I could to realize that I was getting paid about $20,000 less than my male counterparts in the same position. Yet I was also doing more in terms of events and everything else. Um, but yet I was the one being put in the position for the promotion, you know? So it was it was an interesting conversation to have and to uncover that. And the reasons I was told is one, cause I was young. I was a sole single woman in a new city and I didn't have kids and I have family yet they had kids and family, but that's not how we should be paying people. You know what I mean? And it was a, a terrible excuse, but that was the first time I had actually seen it and experienced it. I kept it in mind as I moved forward. And, and so it, 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 it was de definitely a clear, but from a sense of challenges, would I not take a position, you know, to, because of certain pay? Probably not. So I've allowed it. That's the hard part that I probably struggle with myself is that I know what my value is and what I feel like I should be, but here's an opportunity because it's the, this is the one place that might give me the opportunity that I'm ready for. And that's the biggest challenge is the sort of negotiation with yourself, knowing your value, but also knowing that the opportunities are slim. How many people are going to trust me with this role, you know, at this stage in, in this situation? And so I have to negotiate what's best for me and my family and then move forward and continue to build up my worth and my value. And I think that's one of the things that's really challenging. If you're somebody in a position of HR, and the, the interesting thing for me is HR is generally ran by women in our industry. There's a lot of women leaders in HR. How is this disparity happening? Where is this? Why is this happening? When we have women leaders looking at these things and knowing these things, are they empowered to step up and, and be advocates for everybody else across the organization in, in pursuing equity and equality in terms of pay? Um, and I, I, would, I would say that that's a responsibility that we need to look at, but it's gonna, it's gonna take a collective effort. Molly, what do you say about that? Yeah, I think that last point is, is really strong and, and really good. Um, you know, the other thing I would just add to it um, is it's really important. It's, it's, it's proven. I, I don't have the research in front of me, but it is proven that women tend to ask less for pay increases for more money when they're going out to um, uh, going out and seeking a new job. So I think we need to do a better job as women in the business in being confident in what we're worth. 
So going back to that, the, the point that Deanna made, um, it, don't be afraid to ask that. Don't be afraid to ask the question about you know, having 5% more or 10% more or negotiating it however, however is right for you, but don't be afraid to ask for it because there is no doubt in my mind that our male counterparts are asking for it. And they're probably asking for it five, 10 times more than what we're asking for. And I, I just want to point out also, this is what Pro Sports Assembly is really all about as well, is bringing all the leagues together um, so that we can have more transparency. Like, why should it be your responsibility to be finding out what others are making? We all have to take that responsibility for transparency and also hold ourselves the measurement for accountability. And, you know, we will be working together on understanding where the gaps are, but that will require transparency and sharing and where we need to go. And then, you know, actually getting there. Um, let me get a few more questions in before we get to solutions, because I want to end on solutions. Accountability for industry standards. Go, Megan. Uh, you're correct. How can we amplify from Lisa? How can we amplify each other as an industry to give us all the career currency, career currency? We need to reach these goals. How do we rise all boats? Um, so this is part of one of the solutions. So let's take that one and then let's go to some other solutions for change. You know, for me, it's, it goes back to representation and how we amplify and, 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 um, and put ourselves and put each other at the forefront of that representation of those roles and those opportunities. So um, for, for me, a great example is, you know, this year it, it's been extremely frustrating to get to a C-level position and realizing that there's just not a lot of women um, in a lot of underrepresented groups in the C-level uh, position. Um, so what I wanted to do is just elevate the fact that there's a lot of women doing some incredible things. And I launched a podcast. And I wanted to share the stories of everyone that I can come across that are breaking barriers or blazing paths in the right direction to sort of start to break down some of these perceptions and these challenges that women have getting there. So that, that was one of the actions I took. And, and, and the podcast is strictly just to keep continue to amplify and elevate these profiles. And I hope that people keep sharing them and, and we share with each other, but we have to create platforms for each other. Um, nobody's gonna build them for us. And also Aaron, Molly, Aaron, just um, just to support, I think it's Aaron, A-Y-R-O-N. Uh, they were in another conversation, touched on executive presence. Do you feel this is a real thing? If so, how do we cultivate and build in ourselves and others? And Deanna, what you're doing with your podcast to amplify, bring visibility, uh, share stories, and and really the badassery of you know <laughs> these incredible women who are dominating in, in the fields but might not be as visible as they should be is one really great way of the shine theory. When we support one another, we all shine. When we help others rise, we all shine, which is so true. We saw that in the Olympics. Molly. I, I just, I think that's a, such a key point, right? Like we have to support one another as women. We have to be there for each other, pick each other up, um, advocate for one another. And if, if we're not doing that, we're doing all of ourselves a disservice. And so whether it's Deanna's podcast, which is amazing and, um, and, and shining light in that way, whether it's doing things within your own organization and you know, you may have um, somebody, on, and frankly, we should be doing this for anybody. It doesn't really matter whether you're a male or you're a female, but um, that, that we're advocating for great quality work done, right? And, you know, maybe you're a leader and somebody on your team did an amazing job. Well, you should send an email to your president and make that, make your president aware of the job well done. If we don't continue to advocate for for ourselves, nobody else is going to, and we're going to be in the same situation we are five years from now that we are today. And also, I want to move from advocating to activating, because, you know, we talk about allies a lot, and I, I think an ally is important, but to me, that's a first step to activism and being an activist. And there are plenty of women at the top, but just being at the top, that's great for visibility, that's great as a role model, but what are we gonna do? I wanna see us changing the game. 
you know, rewriting the rules, closing the gaps. And I just want to read a couple of things and I want to ask you a very specific question. Um, oh, first of all, Diana, what's your podcast called? Oh, Women Blazers. Okay. Available in all places you can listen to, to podcast. <laughs> Um, so totally recommend Women Blazers and Game of Her Own as Women in Sports Podcasts. Um, also, I just want to say, oh, Alex asks the question, how do you handle women leaders who do not elevate women and almost push or hold them back? One of the two of you, what, just either one of you answer because I want to ask you a last wrap up question before we see the PSA video. Well, I don't know if you have an answer for it. I, you know, honestly, it's probably, that's probably one of the most disappointing interactions I've ever had across my career. And I will be honest, I've had them almost everywhere I've been. Um, and you know what? Like, I, I think there's this expectation that women, because we're women in the same space and there's not a lot of women that we're supposed to like be best friends and have a lot of connection. That's not, that's not true. Like we all have a perspective and we all come from a different way. So I, I don't, I, I think I, I give a pass, honestly, like this might not be something you're interested in. This might not be something that, um, you, you know, you have sort of your, your view of what you're working on and you have a different perspective of, of um, your goals and your vision. And we, we might not align because I want to elevate and keep moving up. Um, and so I, I kind of treat them no different than the male counterparts that, that don't connect. So um, I don't hold them accountable to have to be a rah-rah for women. I don't hold them accountable to have to be a cheerleader for me. Um, again, it goes back to value. And if there's value there, then we'll make a connection. We'll continue to grow together. Go find somebody else. That's what yeah. I <laughs> right? Find somebody I mean, else is going to advocate for you. <laughs> right. I, I think there's an expectation. And I, don't, I think that that is just a lot of pressure on each other. We shouldn't have to pressure each other to advocate for each other. If there's a connection, you'll advocate. And you got to build those relationships and see if there's that connection. And don't become that person. Um, I, I want to wrap with really the actions. Both of you are in sales, you know, as we just talked about. And obviously, the more sales, the higher, you know, we can pay more and all of those things. There are two things that um, become sort of this cyclical challenge. So I want to talk about the opportunity. One is media. Less than 4% of highlight reels feature women in sports. And sales, if we don't have the ticket sales, you know, there's a whole ripple effect. Solutions. Give me a solution. What is a solution for change? Sorry, Shelly, a solution for change around, around the sales side specifically? Around anything of how we bring more visibility to women in sports and create a more equal world. Sports world. I, I guess I, I would... I would look at it um, maybe in three buckets. I'm going to call this, so lead, listen, and learn. So lead, be the people that you want those coming up in the industry to, to be like. Lead with respect, lead with humility. Um, if you hear a stereotype, correct it. Because if you don't, you're part of the problem, right? Um, listen, communicate with one another. Dan and I were talking about, we were just chatting the other day, like, by gosh, just talk to one another, like get to know your male and female counterparts deeper than just the surface level in and out of somebody's office, right? So, so listen, um, be communicative. And then on the learn side, like understand and appreciate that our natural talents are, are what make us all great. And that women bring something to the table that's different than men and allow us to have those opportunities to be part of the dialogue and the conversation. So attend diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. You know, ask yourself, are you being intentional about decisions you're making around diversity, equity, and inclusion? So those are my three things. Lead, listen, and learn. Great. Deanna? Yeah, I, I would support I would support that. I think, you know, in terms of, of getting exposure, you know, I think that's that that's a that's a big challenge and something we need to continue to do. And I would say, you know, if you're somebody in a position that has the ability to put women at the forefront, if you're in PR, if you're in the media team and you get a call about doing an interview, think about who you're asking for those interviews. Um, so often we're going to maybe the, the main guy on this um, employ and encourage the women on your team to step up and be a spokesperson of the organization. To your point in the very beginning and sort of a thread throughout this whole theme is seen as believing. And we need to 
be in positions, if you're in positions that allow and create opportunities, if you're, if you're hosting a conference and you're thinking about speakers, who are you selecting to be on those panels? Who are you selecting to be on your podcast interviews? Think about sort of being a, a, a person who is amplifying those voices and creating the vision of what we want to see in our organization. Just because the numbers are off doesn't mean that we have to present them that way. And that takes a conscious effort and it takes um, intentionality to be able to get there. That's a hard word for me, by the way. <laughs> so the right word, consciousness, intentionality, choice. We all have those powers. We all have that responsibility. Um, Megan is putting in for everyone in chat. So please look at that, how to connect with Pro Sports Assembly, www.prosportsassembly.org slash join so everyone can see that and Katrina I am actually going to end this session with your comments uh, so thank you Katrina solution ideas ready true collaboration a collective vision and a willingness to think differently about the women's sport space amen so true on all of those accounts Diana, Molly, thank you so much for sharing your vision, your wisdom, your experiences, your courage. Um, you are inspirational role models for so many of us. Actually, I think for all of us. So a big shout out, keep doing what you're doing, keep pushing the ball forward um, and, and we will score those goals together. That is for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are incredible. You are getting a lot of love uh, from everyone. Uh, this was incredible. Stay tuned for the rest of the series. And thank you again, Pro Sports Assembly, for all that you are doing to keep the conversation going, but more importantly, to help close the gaps um, and bring more visibility to women in sports. So big kiss to all of you. And thank you everyone for joining. So what is the Pro Sports Assembly? We're the people who work in professional sports, at teams, leagues, and unions who are committed to the advancement of diverse and inclusive leadership across our industry. From staff, administrators, and executives to team owners, operators, and innovators, we strive to lead by example. As a member of the Assembly, you will join industry leaders and gain professional development tools, have access to an exceptional network, be invited to participate in forums and fellowships for professional development, attend exclusive events and engage in discussions led by industry executives. So why now? Professional sports is at an inflection point. Our industry has great influence, global reach, and incomparable community impact. Pro Sports Assembly. Pro Sports Assembly. Pro Sports Assembly. United in Game Plan. Diverse in Council.